All right. Um, yeah, so congrats everyone on making it to the end. This is the last talk. Um, I, I will try to not go over too long, uh, but today I just wanted to give you a little overview of some of the deep learning for science uh, things happening at NERSC, and then uh, obviously tell you about the deep learning stack focusing on Perlmutter because that's our latest uh, exciting machine. And of course, lots of GPUs on it. So very exciting for, for machine learning and deep learning workflows. Um, and I'll discuss how to use some you know, extra sort of deep learning tools and, and frameworks that, that make your life easy when you're doing this kind of work. Uh, so obviously uh, deep learning is, is a very exciting and kind of growing field. It's, it can enhance various um, scientific workflows in interesting ways. It can help you analyze very large complex data sets. Uh, potentially help you accelerate some, you know, computationally expensive simulations. Um, we see a lot of enthusiasm among scientific communities in adopting deep learning for various applications. There's a lot of growth in machine learning and science conferences or workshops. There's a lot of, uh, there's been some significant recognition lately for achievements in AI. So, you know, the 2018 Turing Award or some Gordon Bell Prizes recently were awarded for achievements in machine learning, deep learning. Um, and obviously, HPC centers like us are awarding uh, allocations to do this type of work, and we're optimizing our systems to, to be good at doing things like machine learning. Um, and then, you know, in sort of broader scope beyond just NERSC, obviously the DOE is investing heavily as well in AI for science. There's a number of different funding calls out there, and there's, uh, you know, there's this popular uh, AI for science town hall series, which produced a very long report. Um, but yeah, it's you know a very exciting field to be working in. Obviously, it's sort of unique as well because there's a lot of interest from the industry side. So there's a lot of research being driven by industry stakeholders. So that has led to a huge proliferation of different uh, machine learning techniques out there um, in the scientific machine learning area. I think that's been uh, interesting to see all these different machine learning techniques get applied to all these different scientific areas. Uh, and again, at NERSC, it's cool in engaging with all of our users uh, who come from a variety of different backgrounds. And we see all these different uh, machine learning applications and things like cosmology, material science, genomics, um, climate, and so on. So obviously, um, historically, we've seen this pretty significant trend of uh, deep learning just getting bigger and bigger every year, right? So the models are solving more and more complex tasks. Uh, they're requiring more parameters. Uh, for example, if you look at like large language models today, they have hundreds of billions, even trillions of parameters. Um, we also see this trend reflected in our user base. Um, so we do a, a survey every two years of our machine learning users. And uh, we see you know, people are interested in training uh, larger and larger models, uh, tackling more and more complex scientific machine learning tasks as these, uh, you know, as systems like ProMutter become more available and accessible. So for, for doing deep learning on a HPC system, you really wanna be able to take advantage of you know, the fact that you're running on a supercomputer, right? You wanna be able to run uh, hopefully parallel training. And so the, there's a couple of different ways of doing that. Uh, the most common one is, is data parallelism. Uh, this is where if you have a batch of data that you're training on, you split that up into smaller batches and you send those out to each of the different processors in your job. Um, Another thing you can do is model parallelism. Uh, this is where you take your neural network or your machine learning model and you actually distribute the, the different components of that across the layers. And then you feed all of your data to each of the processors. Um, this is a little bit more complicated to set up in practice often. So people ge generally opt for data parallelism. Um, but also, you know, depending on your problem, you might wanna do some sort of hybrid parallelism technique where you do both data and model parallelism. And probably the most common form of uh, model parallelism that's out there is called kind of it's called layer pipelining, um, where it's kind of just parallelism only across the different layers of your model. So you have the first layer on your first GPU, for example, you have your second layer on your second GPU. And this is something that you do if, for example, your model is so large, you can't even fit all of them on the same um, GPU. So like I said, uh, deep learning uh, data parallelism is, is by far the most common strategy to scale it out, uh, especially if you're doing scaling across nodes or multi-node trainings. Um, so we see the majority of our users opting to use that. The great thing about uh, data parallelism is, is the leading frameworks like TensorFlow or PyTorch, uh, they both support uh, you know, 
it's kind of native data pipeline or data parallelism and pipeline parallelism natively. Uh, so you don't have to really do much extra work to get those kind of functional and performant. Uh, if you do want some extra performance, uh, especially in the case of using TensorFlow, you can also use Horovod. That's kind of the most popular uh, distributed training framework that isn't actually built into TensorFlow or PyTorch. And uh, there's a couple other ones as well on this plot, but, but basically all of these support either MPI or Nickel backends. Um, MPI is what you would use if you're running on a CPU cluster. Obviously, nowadays, most people are running on GPU systems, and so they're using NVIDIA's Nickel library for communication between GPUs. Um, the, the Probably the most common form of data parallel training or scaling up that we see is, is weak scaling, where you try to converge your training faster by taking uh, you know, fewer training steps, but each of those steps is, is a bigger step. Uh, so the way this works is if you kind of look at what's happening in, in the way you train these models, you're using the stochastic gradient descent algorithm uh, and you're, you're sampling your data and you're getting an estimate of the gradient with respect to your loss function. You're trying to take a step to decrease your loss function or so decrease your error, right? And so what you can do is if you add more GPUs to your job, you can get a larger global batch size. Uh, and what that gives you is hopefully a, a less noisy or a better estimate of the actual gradient that you care about. And so hopefully you can take, a, it's safe to take a larger step, right? So you can use a larger learning rate in this gradient descent algorithm. Um, so in this cartoon example here, it's just kind of a diagram showing maybe on your single GPU training, you have to take three steps, um, three different gradient updates, Whereas if you have more GPUs with a bigger batch size, you have a better estimate, so you can just take one big step. Um, so that sounds great in practice. Obviously, there's some caveats sometimes. So this often requires a lot of tuning to get it exactly right if you want to converge stably um, at large scale. And so there's a lot of different considerations, uh, little tricks you can do where you change the learning rate throughout the, the training, maybe warm it up and then scale it up or, and slowly decay it. Um, you can use different optimizers. They have these special adaptive optimizers, for example. Uh, there's a lot of details there. So I encourage you, if you're curious, to go check out our deep learning at scale tutorial. Uh, we do this pretty much every year at SE. Uh, so we're, we'll be there again this year, but uh, you can always check last year's material as well for more tips there. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about what the actual software set looks like on Perlmutter for deep learning. Our general strategy here is to give you kind of functional and, and high performance uh, installations kind of out of the box. And we do this, we focus on the most popular frameworks, obviously. But we also want you to be able to, um, you know, have, have enough flexibility where you can customize it to your particular use cases, maybe install whatever Python packages that you need for your domain specific, you know, data analysis uh, steps, or maybe you have special data pipeline that you need to set up to read your data files. Um, so flexibility is also key. Uh, we support the, the main, you know, the, the top three frameworks right now are TensorFlow, Keras, and PyTorch. And basically Keras is, is now folded into TensorFlow. So you can access uh, all the Keras API calls just through tensorflow.keras. Um, to do distributed training with either of these, you can of course use whatever is already there built in to each of those, um, or you can use the, the Horovod library that I mentioned. Um, so we also provide, uh, our, for example, our TensorFlow installation, we use Horovod um, to help do distributed training. That's there by default. Uh, and then you know, external tools that are really useful for deep learning that we've heard some great info on already are Jupyter and Shifter. So I'll, I'll mention a little bit more details on those later. Um, yeah, like I said, you know, out of the box, I think the easiest way for you to get up and running on Perlmutter just to do deep learning is to just use the modules that we've already installed. So we have TensorFlow and PyTorch modules. Of course, TensorFlow and PyTorch are just, you know, Pythonic libraries, right? So you just, it's the top level language that everyone loves in machine learning is Python. Um, so these are just uh, conda environments, basically, that we've built with optimized installations of, of the software stack for TensorFlow and PyTorch. Um, we have a couple different versions available, so if you have a need for a particular version, you can explicitly load that, or, or you can just try to pick up whatever one is default there. Um, 
We've already heard a lot about, you know, how to customize your, your Python environments and stuff. Uh, one kind of easy way you can do it with these is just to use this pip install user method. And, and that works because we, we've set automatically that Python user base uh, folder for you. So it doesn't, you know, it, it, anything you install on top of the TensorFlow or PyTorch modules, it won't kind of pollute any of your other Python environments, which is convenient. Uh, another great option is you can just do a direct conda clone of any of these. Um, so if you do like module display TensorFlow or module display PyTorch, it'll, sh it'll show you like the path of the actual conda environment corresponding to that module. You can clone that into your own personal version and then do whatever you want with it afterwards. And then finally, of course, you can always just start from scratch and create your own custom conda environments. Um, this can be useful, for example, if you're trying to replicate someone's software stack where they need a specific CUDA toolkit version or something, that's a good option. Obviously, um, I, I encourage you to um, come back to this presentation afterwards and visit all the links to our documentation. There's a lot more info there and, and some code examples that you can kind of copy for all these different use cases. Uh, we just heard a great presentation on Shifter Perlmutter. So that's our current solution for supporting uh, containers. And uh, it's great. That's what I use for pretty much all of my deep learning uh, workloads. Uh, it's, I think it's pretty easy to use. And as Lori mentioned, it's, it's very performant, especially at scale. So even our, you know, our top 500 entry used a container to run. Uh, you can just see the, the currently available images on the system by doing Shifter image images and uh, as they're shared across all users. There's actually a lot of PyTorch or TensorFlow containers kind of already there waiting. So you might even just be able to grab one of those and start using it. Uh, you can also pull anything you need from Docker Hub pretty easily. Um, and you can build your own containers as well, um, as Lori was mentioning. Uh, I guess she already also spoke about how to use interactively or, or in SBatch scripts. So I won't go over these. Um, but I will just mention that, uh, yeah, as Lori mentioned, the, the NVIDIA containers for deep learning on GPUs are by far, I think the best starting point. So the, these are the NGC or NVIDIA GPU cloud containers. Uh, they've already set up kind of optimized uh, images with PyTorch or TensorFlow and Horovod. These have optimized drivers and CUDA runtimes, Nickel, CUDA net installations, so literally everything you would need, right? Uh, there's a lot of different versions available. So if you need a particular TensorFlow version, you know, or a particular PyTorch version to reproduce some code from, you know, a year ago or whatever, you should be able to pull that specific version from their uh, service on Docker Hub. We also provide some versions of these that are kind of like, you know, NERSC specializations of them. And those just have a, a couple of useful extra Python packages in them that we see a lot of our deep learning users kind of wanting or, or using frequently. Uh, for example, in, in our PyTorch one, we install the inops library because that's a, a pretty popular library for doing kind of tensor manipulations and models. Um, we also have a, our, in, in these ones, we have a parallel H5Py installation. So that's kind of convenient if you have uh, maybe some training that you're doing and then you wanna do parallel IO afterwards. Um, yeah, you can also build your own containers if you want. It's very easy to build on top of NVIDIA's NGC containers. In fact, that's exactly what we do. Uh, and we have some examples for how to do that um, linked from our documentation. You can also do this pip install user method if you want. You just have to manually set this, this Python user base path yourself. Uh, and then finally, Lori totally went over this, so I don't even need to mention it, but uh, yeah, the NVIDIA NGC containers use OpenMPI, so of course you need to do that little extra step where you disable the mpitch model uh, module for shifter and use uh, MPI equals PMI2. Okay, so yeah, so for some sort of general guidelines for if you're doing distributed training or maybe you have your single GPU code and you wanna make it a multi-GPU code, um, if you're working in TensorFlow, we recommend using Horovod to do this. And that's just because uh, if you're going kind of beyond the single node scale, so if you're doing like multi-node, you need 16 nodes for your training, it's much easier to use uh, Horovod, in our opinion, than the built-in TensorFlow distribution strategy. Uh, it's, yeah, it's easy to use with our Slurm schedule, and it uses MPI and Nickel to kind of coordinate communications and send data between processes. 
obviously it's great because it has lots of examples online too. So it's pretty easy to just follow and, and, and start working um, quickly on it. TensorFlow also has some really good profiling capabilities built in. So if you want to kind of improve the performance of your training code, look at maybe what, uh, what part might be slowing you down. There's a really easy way to just kind of import the TensorFlow profiler and use it. Uh, for PyTorch, uh, we don't even really need anything beyond just the library itself. So PyTorch has a really good built-in library for distri distributed training. It's called Distributed Data Parallel. Uh, it just kind of wraps whatever model that you've already created, uh, makes it really easy to do distributed training. Uh, they've spent a lot of effort kind of optimizing this and making examples and stuff. So it's a great starting point. And this one actually doesn't even need MPI. So it just uses nickel for all communications between uh, GPUs. Just for some, some extra sort of general tips here, um, as I said, we, we recommend providing our, or using our uh, you know, already provided built modules or containers if you can. That's a very good starting point. Could probably limits the amount of setup work that you have to do. And we've already tested these uh, pretty thoroughly for functionality and performance. Also allows us to kind of track uh, who's using what and helps us kind of set up our support strategy for future systems. So that's nice. Um, if you're doing developing and testing work, obviously using the interactive queue or, or interactive Slurm jobs or working on Jupyter is really nice because you can just get on-demand resources and quickly look at something, right? Um, if you want to track your trainings, uh, I recommend using either TensorBoard or Weights and Biases. These are external tools I'll talk about in a moment that help you kind of track what's going on during training. And then, of course, uh, for performance tuning, you can do things like check the CPU and GPU utilization to see if there's bottlenecks. Uh, so you can use something like TOP or NVIDIA SMI to do that. And that'll just tell you, you know, for example, if your GPU utilization is really low, maybe that's an indication that your data pipeline is not very efficient. This is often the most common source of bottlenecks we see in our users' uh, training codes. It's, you know, the, the CPU is trying to get some data off the file system and provide it to the GPU for the training step. So the GPU is kind of just waiting and it's not the most efficient. Uh, and so to speed that up, you can kind of use like some of the recommendations that are just built into these frameworks like TensorFlow or PyTorch have a lot of recommendations. Uh, you can use multi-threading in your data loader. You can try and stage data or cache it. Um, so recommend following their tutorials on optimizing your data loader for sure. If you really want to you know, do a deep dive, you can of course profile your code. You can use NVIDIA's Insight Systems tool for that, or you can use any of the, you know, like the built-in TensorFlow profiler. TensorBoard also has a profiler that works with PyTorch if you want. So recommend those as well. I guess I don't really need to say much about Jupyter since we already had some excellent presentation on that. Um, I will just point out that we already have our, our, you know, TensorFlow and PyTorch modules installed as kernels. So if you start up a server and start up a notebook in that server, you can just select you know, TensorFlow and it should work pretty much out of the box. Should be able to import TensorFlow easily. Same thing for PyTorch. Uh, or you can use your own custom kernel if you have specific libraries that you need. Uh, so I touched a little bit on TensorBoard, which is different from TensorFlow. <laughs> TensorBoard you can use with either TensorFlow or PyTorch. Uh, but this is a great tool for visualizing and kind of monitoring your experiments. So as you're doing a model training, you can track the loss over time. You can see, you know, you can add custom metrics. So you, if you have some specific statistic that you care about, you can see what the value of that is. Um, we have a little TensorFlow helper, or sorry, TensorBoard helper uh, in Jupyter. So if you have a Jupyter notebook, you can just import this uh, and then it'll give you a URL to go visit and that it should be where um, all of your data is kind of getting displayed into a nice little convenient dashboard. Now beyond that, um, it's also very important in deep learning to do hyperparameter tuning. Um, so hyperparameter optimization is a key uh, you know, stage of the deep learning process. And obviously, it can be sort of embarrassingly parallel if you're just searching over a wide range of parameters. So it's a good fit for systems like Perlmutter, where you have lots of resources available. Um, because there's just so many tools out there for HPO, uh, we don't really you know, like ask that you use one in particular. We, we kind of generally support whatever people want to. 
we don't install these uh, in their own separate things. Uh, so some of these are already there in the TensorFlow and PyTorch modules that we built, um, but they're also probably easy to set up if you need some custom solution for HPO. All right, I am going as fast as I can here. Uh, these are the last two slides, so hopefully we're not too much over time. I uh, just wanted to mention also some additional resources for you know people who are maybe more newcomer or they want to see they have some deep learning familiarity, but they don't know too much about applying it for actual you know scientific applications. Um, the deep learning for science school is something we put on a couple of years ago that has a lot of re uh, resources. So all of the lectures and the demos and stuff are available. Um, so I recommend visiting that and, and looking through. There's some interesting topics there that definitely go beyond just like introduction to deep learning style stuff. I also mentioned this deep learning at scale tutorial. So this will give you a lot of detailed information on how to profile optimize your code and then how to start scaling it out uh, across multiple GPUs, multiple nodes, up to maybe thousands of GPUs if you really need that scale. Uh, so we'll be doing that tutorial again this year at SC, but you can also just go to last year's material following that link right there. Um, yeah, so that's that's all I had for you today. Uh, thanks for thanks for your attention. Thanks for your interest in deep learning. I hope you agree that uh, there's a lot of good options for doing machine learning and deep learning on Perlmutter. Um, and of course, file any tickets or, or reach out for any additional assistance you need. And uh, I'll just end with one more plug for this machine learning at NERSC survey which is what we do every two years. It would be great to hear from you about what your specific needs are, what your current machine learning workloads look like. So yeah, thank you all.